Welcome back to the Reckless Rents Garage. On this episode, we're talking all about front three links. I put together this little mock-up in the garage before we go and build this on the Ranger because I thought it'd be a great example to show how to actually put one of these together yourself on whatever vehicle you're working with. And I kind of just wanted to play with some of my shiny new parts before we go out and throw them on the truck. But today, we're gonna cover how to actually build a three-link suspension and all of the hardware and tools that you're gonna need to do this yourself. I think you're gonna find it that it's actually a lot easier than, you're, than you think it will. And if you're planning on solid axle swapping a vehicle or just switching over from leaf springs to a coil spring or a coil over, I think you're gonna find this very helpful. start talking about all the three link tech that you guys are here for like anti-dive link separation all that good stuff i have two disclaimers i want to say first number one i guarantee you anywhere on the internet that you go you could find someone that can dispute all of this information uh and what it comes down to is people have preferences people have the way that they've built their vehicles and i'm just giving you general guidelines and general rules that people use to build a three link suspension number two you can sit there, crunch numbers on the calculator all day long, take all the measurements you want, but at the end of the day, remember, we are totally limited by the chassis that we are building on. If we're using an existing vehicle, we're limited by the stock frame, the body, the location of the engine and transmission, all that stuff that's not really something that we could change very easily, we're limited by that. So just keep that in mind, you might not be able to get perfect numbers or you might not be able to hit exactly what the guidelines say to do. Anyway. Disclaimer is over, let's get into the three link tech. One of the most useful tools in planning and building your three link suspension is the link suspension calculator. Once you download the calculator, you have a spreadsheet that you could fill out and input all of your measurements and the calculator is gonna provide a nice picture of what your suspension will look like and some data on how it will perform. Input your wheelbase, tire diameter, radius, and weight as accurately as possible. The sprung mass CG or center of gravity is measured by using the distance from the ground to the highest bolt on the transmission bell housing. On lightweight aluminum engines, sometimes people will use the back of the crankshaft or the cam for the CG measurement. The next section is all of the measurements from your axle, vehicle, and link bars. If you hover your mouse over one of the fields, there will be instructions on how to take the measurement that the calculator wants. As you make inputs to the table, the visual model will reflect it, as well as the outputs from the calculator on the right-hand side. One output of the calculator that is critical to focus on is the anti-squat percentage. In a front suspension, this value will be called anti-dive. Now you might be wondering, what the heck is anti-dive and why should I care about it? Anti-dive is the effect of the suspension moving during acceleration and braking. When building a suspension, it is very important to know how it should behave when you're driving the vehicle. This is an example of a three-link suspension with anti-dive over 100%. An anti-dive value above 100% will cause the front end to compress while accelerating and it will cause the suspension to stiffen when you hit the brakes. This suspension geometry might be desirable for a vehicle doing hill climbs because it will help keep the front end down. However, it will not be that good at absorbing rough terrain. If we go back to the previous model and adjust the upper and lower links, we can see a suspension with low anti-dive. An anti-dive value under 100% will have the opposite effect. The front end will lift during acceleration and it will compress or nosedive during braking. These are ideal characteristics for off-road racing and some prefer this setup for hill climbs because it allows the suspension to extend while climbing. Here is a comparison of the two models side by side. Now when you input your measurements into the calculator, you know how the anti-dive will affect the suspension performance. If you draw an imaginary line from the upper and lower links, where they meet at is the instant center. Depending on where your instant center falls in relation to the 100% anti-dive line, this will give you a high or low anti-dive. Now you might be asking what anti-dive value should you build your suspension to? The answer to that question is, well there is no perfect suspension to build. It is going to vary by driver and terrain, 
but I can give you some guidelines when you build your link suspension to follow. Three link suspension, we have two lower links, one upper link, and then there will be a pan hard up front. I just don't have the way to actually uh, stabilize the pan hard up here, so I don't have it in my mock-up, but we will talk more about that later. First, we're gonna talk about the lower links of a three link suspension. Now, ideally, you're gonna want these about two times the length of your wheel travel. That's kind of the general rule of thumb. A lot of times between 36 and around 42 inches is typically what you'll see. Now again, your chassis and wheelbase are going to be major factors in that, but a longer and flatter link is going to perform better. Keep in mind though that no matter what material you use for your links, the longer they are, the more prone to bending they will be. My lower links are going to be made out of 2 inch quarter wall DOM. That is what I would recommend anyone as a minimum to make theirs out of. So quick tip, if you are someone who likes to visualize things like myself and Chris, uh, before you go and just burn everything on, you can pick up some PVC pipe, kind of like I have right here, and use those to mock up your links and kind of get an idea of what everything's gonna look like. When you're mounting your lower links to the axle, you're gonna want them wider on the axle and narrower on the frame side. So it has a slight amount of triangulation built into it. This takes some of the strain off of the pan hard bar. Uh, it reduces a little bit of flex steer. Uh, so another advantage of having your lower links uh, angled inboard towards your frame. Um, so whenever you turn your wheel and crank your tires over, you'll have more clearance from the tire and the link so you can get more steering angle out of your front axle, which you want all of the steering that you can get, trust me. So your lower links are fairly simple to put together and straightforward, but your upper link is a little bit trickier. On your upper link, you need vertical separation from your lower link. So it needs to be mounted higher on the axle. The general rule of thumb is to do 25% of what your tire diameter is going to be. This is going to be one of those areas where you might have to compromise when you go out and start measuring on your vehicle. You know, you might be like, oh yeah, I have a, I'm going to have a 40 inch tire. I want 10 inches of separation. Uh, and then you go out on your truck and you realize that if you have your upper link mount sticking way up here, it's going to be jamming into the crank pulley or your oil pan or something like that. So you might have to sacrifice and lower that a little bit. So if you go and do some research online, one area that you're going to find some conflicting information is how long to make this upper link. Now there's kind of two schools of thought here. The first school is to make your upper link longer than your lower link. What that does is when the axle droops, it will cause the pinion to point at your transfer case and have optimal drive shaft angles. The other school of thought is to have your upper link shorter than your lowers. And what that does on droop, it is going to tilt your pinion down, but it is going to maintain a better steering geometry. So if you have a super long upper link, like what I have pictured here, um, whenever your axle drops down, your pinion is going to be pointed right at the transfer case, which is great for your drive shaft, but you're going to be steering on the front of your tires, which is not good. I believe on a vehicle that sees a lot of street time, it's ideal to have a shorter upper link. So when you droop out the suspension, uh, you have better steering characteristics and you're not driving on the front of the tires. Uh, if you have a trailer queen vehicle or a vehicle that sees almost all of its time off road, yeah, you know, it might be more beneficial for you to have a longer upper link to have a better drive shaft angle. Another thing that's going to dictate what you do with that is your pinion. I have a high pinion front axle and I'm not going to have as much drive shaft angle issues as people with a low pinion. I'm using a completely adjustable link mount from Barnes Four Wheel Drive and we'll talk more about all the hardware in a little bit, but there's three positions here. So you can change your link separation at the frame. The benefit of being able to change that is you'll be able to change your anti-dive characteristics. So the ideal setup would be in the middle, you could have 100% anti-dive. Above that would be greater than 100%. And then below that would be less than 100% anti-dive. So you could set it right there in the middle, test it out, change it, see which one you like better and go from there. This upper link, we want it right around five to six inches higher than our lower link. So generally, people are going to be shooting for under 100% anti-dive. It seems to be preferred between 50 and 75%, uh, 
But again, a lot of that's gonna be preference and what type of driving you're doing. So I recommend getting one of these adjustable upper link mounts so that way you can have three different settings and kind of play around with what you feel like or change it for the type of driving that you know that you're gonna be doing. When it comes to upper length material thickness, I'm gonna be using one and a half quarter wall DOM. Uh, the reason why I'm not using as large of material as my lower links is number one, the upper length is tucked up out of the way. You really should not ever get any impacts on this. But number two, this is going right next to my drive shaft. Like my clearances are very small. So I needed a narrower piece of tubing uh, to be able to do that. And I went with a one and a half quarter wall use what you're able to fit in there and yeah if you could put a beefy link in there you know go for it it will be heavier and not as necessary because it's not going to take the impacts but uh yeah just keep that in mind so the final component that we're going to talk about of the three link suspension is your pan hard or track bar whatever you want to call it the track bar is responsible for controlling the lateral movement of the axle this is going to prevent your axle from coming out sideways from underneath your vehicle when you're going down the road it's very important Typically, people with a three link are going to have a steering box, and when you have a steering box and a pan hard, the way you want to set up your pan hard is to match the length and the angle of your drag link coming from your steering box to your steering arm as close as possible because it prevents bump steer. So bump steer is when you're going down the road and you hit a bump in the road or a pothole or something like that, and if these are not in the same plane or they're significantly different lengths, when you hit that bump, the suspension is going to move and it's going to actually turn your steering with it. So you'll hit a bump and then you'll feel it in your wheel and it's very uncomfortable feeling. So the less bump steer that you could build into this, the better. So you, it's really critical that you match the angle and the length as close as possible to those two components. Now, if you're building this with full hydro steering and you don't have a steering box and a drag link to worry about, it's a little bit easier. Um, it's recommended to build the axle mount up as, as high as you can with the constraints of your chassis and your frame and all that. Um, but you want your pan hard to be as long and as flat as you could possibly fit it in there. I'm using an adjustable track bar bracket on the frame side from Barnes 4-Wheel Drive. This has four different mounting options. So I'll really be able to dial in the angle of my track bar and match my steering drag length as close as possible. And we should be able to get pretty good geometry out of this. So your pan hard is going to see a ton of stress preventing all the side to side motions of your axle and you need to make sure you build this strong. For the tubing, I'm using one and a half quarter wall DOM and on the frame end, I recommend plating the frame prior to welding on any pan hard bracket. For joints, I'm going to use a 7 8 time, but I would say you could go down to a 3 quarter inch time and be just fine there as well. So that sums up all the main components of a three link suspension. Real quick, I'm going to go over to the table and do a quick breakdown of all the rod ends and the components I'm using to make all this happen on the truck. I sourced all of my components from Barnes 4-Wheel Drive because we've used a ton of their stuff in the past on the Suburban. We've built the Radius Arms and the 4-Link and the Ranger has a ton of stuff from them already and I have no complaints whatsoever. Their stuff is beefy, it holds up, and it's priced pretty fairly. So check out the links in the description for any of this kind of stuff and I definitely recommend using Barnes 4-Wheel Drive. Now, the big boys. These are the Barnes Enduro Joint. It's a one and a quarter inch rod end and they give you ample shank on here for tons of adjustability and strength. I really like the size of the shank on this. Um, this is a Cremoli heat treated joint, extremely strong and it's rebuildable. You can take these apart relatively easy if you ever need to do a full rebuild if you're really hard on your components uh, and they're serviceable. They have a grease port on there. Recommend getting those for your lowers. So one thing to think about whenever you're ordering all of your stuff, uh, Barnes offers for their tubing adapters, you can get them to mill a hex end on that so you can throw a wrench on there. I recommend that. After doing the four link on the Ranger and the Suburban, I wish I would have had these on all of those. Uh, so I opted for that because it makes adjustment and locking down these jam nuts way easier. So definitely think about that. Another thing, you're going to want a right hand and a left hand threaded uh, rod end for each link. So that way, whenever you do need to make adjustments, you could just break the jam nuts and then twist your link and it will uh, thread in or thread out and it's super nice like that. My pan hard bracket, this is the outside frame pan hard bracket. It has four adjustment holes so you can really dial in and get the angle that you want on there and you just stick it up to the side of your frame, glue that guy on. My inner frame mount, uh, this is going to be for my upper link. This is the Barnes adjustable 
inner frame mount. So this will weld right inside the C-channel. I have three adjustment slots and I'm using a 7 8 Heim joint on, uh, on this guy there. So while I was ordering a bunch of stuff from Barnes, I picked up some of these new Magnum Heim joints. These are a three quarter inch Heim, so this will be good for a track bar or any sort of steering setup that you got. Um, it's a Magnum because, yeah, it's got a big old shank on it. <laughs> uh, I thought this was awesome because having the adjustability of this long shank is very nice whenever you're dialing in any of your components. So you can see, this is just a standard 7 8 Heim compared to the Magnum. You have so much more adjustability. So another option that you could look into on that. I pieced all these parts together. Um, Barnes actually offers complete kits, which if you are starting from scratch, I recommend doing that. My axle already had a lot of components put on there, so I only needed a few pieces and the rod end, so I didn't need to do a whole kit. So any DOM tubing that you're gonna need for your pan hard, your lower links, or your upper links, Barnes will also sell you chunks of that as well to complete your entire setup so you can make an order and then get everything on your vehicle as fast as possible. Alright guys, I hope you learned a little bit about 3-link suspensions. Drop a comment down below. Let us know what you thought about the episode. Hit that thumbs up button if you liked it. Subscribe to us if you want to see me build this 3-link and put this on the truck here soon because we have a lot of trips coming up that i got to get this thing ready for. Get out into your driveway, build yourself a suspension, and get wheeling. Until next time. Stay reckless.